So I'm in London at the winter meeting of the British Pharmacological Society with Professor Rod Flower from the William Harvey Institute. And today we've been hearing about lipids and other inflammatory mediators as potentially important targets for treating patients. So Rod, would you start by giving some of the, the historical background to how we, we got the early targets for lipids as treatment? Yes, uh, I think it's a very interesting problem actually. Uh, if you go back to the 1930s, 1940s, um, although some biologically active lipids had been identified, um, for example, prostaglandins in, in seminal fluid, for example, nobody had actually identified them as being lipids. They were simply known as biologically active substances then. And I think, you know, had you asked most biochemists or pharmacologists of the day whether they thought lipids or lipid mediators were a suitable uh, subject for research, they would have just laughed at you because in those days lipids were simply thought of as structural components of the cell, as bits of cell membrane and, and axon, uh, sheaths on axons and so on. It wasn't thought that they were in any way dynamic or that they could be turned over rapidly or that they could be used to produce the plethora of mediators we have today. Interestingly enough, it was um, one of the first uh, experiments that showed that this view was not true was was one of the very very first radioactive traces ever to be used in uh, experimental medicine and that was uh, radioactive phosphorus and when this was injected into animals uh, it was rapidly taken up into phospholipids in cell membranes but what really baffled everybody was how quickly it was uh, removed and recycled and and generally it's it sort of the very very dynamic nature of, of lipids and, and this changed everybody's world view about the phospholipids in cell membranes. They suddenly began to realize that these were, this was a pool of, of substances that was changing very, very rapidly indeed. And then of course in the 60s we had the discovery, uh, the identification of and characterization of prostaglandins as this very unusual uh, 20 carbon uh, moiety with a, an unusual uh, ring structure and so on. and um, PGE2 and PGF2 alpha were the first to be discovered, or the first to be characterized, I should say. They were extracted from seminal plasma, and they were extracted into ether by Swedish scientists in the Karolinska Institute, and um, those which migrated into the ether phase were called PGE for ether, and those which remained in the phosphate buffer phase were called PGF, because in Swedish, phosphate is spelt with an F and PGF2-alpha, which is the what that substance was now, we now know, is more polar, so it would tend to stay in the aqueous buffer, whereas PGE is less polar, so it would tend to migrate into the ether. So that's how the whole field started. And what's, what's fascinating amongst the story is, is you've described a number of these families of, of, of lipids, mm -hmm. and the prostaglandins were, were only discovered quite recently, only a few decades ago. But in fact, the medicines we, we now realise work through that, have been around for quite some time. Could, could, could you explain how this, this arose back in, 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 uh, in Victorian days in, in terms of first discovery? Of yes, well, chemicals? indeed, that, that's another very interesting area. And I mean, if you look back into sort of folk medicine or, as I prefer to call it, proto-pharmacology <laughs> uh, days, of course, uh, salicylic acid was used extensively uh, in its natural form, which is uh, barks of trees, certain plants. Many, many plants contain salicylic acid. Uh, either as a free acid or more likely as a conjugate with glucose or some other sugar. And the molecule is actually thought to be involved in plant host defense mechanisms in some way that I don't think anyone's really worked out. But anyway, it was observed by many cultures that, uh, for example, bark, the bark of a willow tree and uh, other plants containing salicylic acid had anti-inflammatory and antipyretic actions. and. It was used extensively for the treatment of fevers, which in those days generally meant malaria, I suppose. Um, the active principle wasn't really established as being salicylic acid until the late 19th century. And um, even then, all the salicylic acid that was used medicinally was extracted from plants. And in particular, one, uh, rose hips were a particularly rich source of salicylic acid. And that uh, turns out to be significant later on. But um, in the, the uh, about 1870, uh, salicylic acid, the synthesis of salicylic acid, was was uh, uh, achieved for the first time using a you know a, a purely synthetic approach.
and this process was later industrialized uh, by uh, Kolbe and his colleagues at Marburg University in Germany. And salicylic acid itself became a best-selling drug uh, for the treatment of fevers. But having said that, what, what we then have is what we recognize now as balance between benefit and risk because it wasn't very well tolerated it by was, many people. No, it wasn't very well tolerated, and it, it caused very, very severe GI effects, um, particularly vomiting and uh, dyspepsia and so on. Bayer became very interested in, in salicylic acid for a number of reasons. First of all, it was a best-selling drug, and, and they wanted one as well, which is very reasonable. But also, they wanted to try and work to produce a salicylic acid that was better tolerated. And they, Heinrich Dresser, who was the chief pharmacologist at, at, at Bayer gave this job to a man called Felix Hoffman who was a chemist and Felix Hoffman took salicylic acid and he treated it uh, in such a way as to acetylate it and uh, this was actually a technique that had been uh, applied before although it sort of got buried in the literature but he did it and the story goes that he tested it out first of all on his father his father apparently had very bad arthritis and was taking salicylic acid and found it to be intolerable in the doses he needed to take. And the story goes, Felix took some of the product home, gave it to his father, who said, oh, this is much better, and it's much better tolerated, rather ironically, as it turns out. But that's how the, uh, the story got started. Um, Dresser, uh, Heinrich Dresser, was uh, uh, eventually won over to the idea that this could be a new blockbuster drug. They toyed with various names for it. Um, Heinrich Dresser originally thought he might call it Eusprin, but they settled on the name of Aspirin, and I, I think the most likely explanation is that the, the A stands for acetyl, and Spirin comes from the name of the rose hip, which is Olmeria uh, spirea, that's the Linnaean name, and I think that they used that as sort of a, a way of, of producing a short name, a snappy name, Aspirin, and that's, that's become the trade name ever since. And moving to more recent times, would you describe what led to understanding how, how aspirin works and the connection between prostaglandins and, and, and this interesting chemical? Yes, of course. I mean, aspirin, of course, was bought in in 1898 or 1899 and um, remained uh, a staple uh, drug for many, many years. Um, and, of course, once you have a drug that works, pharmacologists are very good at finding animal models and other models in which the drug produces an effect so that they can then go and screen other molecules that do the same. So aspirin spawned what I call aspirin's children, uh, drugs like phenylbutazone, drugs like indomethacin. These were all developed after aspirin but using the same types of reasoning that if you had a drug that produced, that reduced acute inflammation and you could use it as a screen and then you could produce drug, other drugs that uh, had the same effect. Um, it wasn't really, uh, and it's interesting for another reason actually, and that is you don't need to know how a drug works to produce very, very effective uh, drugs that do the same thing. But anyway, the, the upshot was that all these drugs um, became known as the aspirin-like drugs because they all had a very similar pharmacology. And the principal points of the pharmacology were, first of all, these drugs had an antipyretic action, they had an analgesic action, they had an anti-inflammatory action, and they also caused stomach problems kidney problems and uh, usually bleeding problems as well and somehow these effects were all linked together because all these drugs had these effects to, to one extent or the other but no one could understand um, what the link was um, and it wasn't until developments in the prostaglandin area uh, began to really take off with the discovery of the so-called COX enzyme, the cyclooxygenase which transforms arachidonic acid and other 20 carbon unsaturated fatty acids into prostaglandins and the the biosynthetic route was established by groups at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden and also the Unilever laboratories in the Netherlands. Once that had been established people began to experiment with these prostaglandins and um, I think at this point uh, it's nice to thank the Upjohn company because they produced uh, a lot of these compounds and gave them free to the academic community uh, for testing and I think without that we wouldn't know half as much as we do about prostaglandin pharmacology. But anyway it became clear that uh, prostaglandins had a, a suite of effects which in some ways matched uh, the aspirin actions. For example they could cause fever, uh, 
Uh, they could cause inflammation if they were injected into knee joints, for example. They could cause pain or at least uh, allodynia or hyperalgesia. Uh, they could inhibit gastric acid production and heal ulcers. And they could also increase renal blood flow. So there seemed to be a sort of a parallelism between the, the two. And of course, increased vascular permeability, permeability and, and cause all the things we know that lead to inflammation. Absolutely true, yes. Um, but of course, as, as with all these things, it, it takes a sort of a genius mentality to see the link. And um, it was John Vane's idea after reading a review on prostaglandin actions one weekend, he came in and said, I think I know how aspirin works. And he came up with this idea that possibly aspirin blocked the enzyme which produces prostaglandins from arachidonic acid. And he did a really simple experiment um, using a homogenated guinea pig lung and measuring the prostaglandins using a smooth muscle assay, uh, which uh, demonstrated his idea was correct. And it was published in Nature in 1971, together with three other papers uh, uh, that year, which addressed various aspects of that problem. For example, did aspirin work in humans after human consumption? Did it work in perfused organs and so on? And really, the upshot of those four papers really was the entire scientific basis of NSAID therapy in the future. And this fundamental discovery, of course, led to his being awarded the Nobel Absolutely. Prize for his... that, that was specifically cited on his Nobel, in his Nobel citation. That's, that's correct. So, so what we have then is, is an in interesting story. We, we have a, a chemical which goes back to nature. Mm. We, we have um, a question of safety mm. and, and improving that from patient's benefit. And we've got discovery of how it works much later. And, and that then raises the question, how, how do we then have the, the various benefits we, we have for aspirin? You talked about fever and pain and inflammation, but it's also used, for example, for preventing heart attacks and strokes. That's correct. Well, one of the... Aspirin is a little bit unique. It's unlike all the other uh, NSAIDs or aspirin-like drugs uh, in the sense that it produces uh, an irreversible block of the cyclooxygenase, and it does that by acetylating a key residue in the active site of the cyclooxygenase. And um, this means that once the cyclooxygenase has been acetylated by aspirin, it, it has to be either resynthesized or else the enzyme is completely dead. Well now, most tissues can resynthesize the enzyme, uh, but cells like platelets can't because they have a very limited uh, capacity for protein synthesis, if indeed they can make proteins at all. So that means that by taking a, a low-dose aspirin, for example, you can kill off the platelet cyclooxygenase in perpetuity for the platelet because it can never make a replacement enzyme. And this has led to the concept that using very low doses of aspirin, like 75 milligrams, you can selectively inhibit uh, the platelet cyclooxygenase. And because some prostaglandin-like substances, for example thromboxane, are generated by platelets during the aggregating process and are important uh, in order to bring that about, then this can explain why aspirin has a, a very potent antiplatelet effect, which incidentally was something that was noted uh, many, many years before, although no one had a good explanation for it. So it illustrates that then partly how aspirin helps to prevent these heart attacks and strokes, but also its, it's risk as an agent, which is very important as a potential cause for, for bleeding. Uh, Indeed, that's right. I, I think with, with, the as with aspirin, um, in fact with all NSAIDs, there are, there are two components, and I, um, I think the first thing to say is if you treat animals or man, although it's very rarely done, systemically with NSAIDs, you can still get ulcers and erosions and gastric bleeding. So it's not necessarily anything to do with the topical effect, but if you take capsules of aspirin and uh, or uh, NSAIDs, obviously they are delivered to your stomach in an extremely high concentration. And because they're mainly weak organic acids, they tend to get trapped in the uh, parietal cells because once they move into the cell, uh, the low pH, they become protonated and then they don't diffuse out again. So I think there is an element of topical irritation there with some of these drugs, although there's no doubt that reduction of prostaglandin generation is very important as well. So that explains why if people do develop indigestion on aspirin or unrated drugs. It's very important that they seek some medical advice rather than ignore that, it. That's absolutely right. I, I think that it, it, it affects probably about 30% of people at least who take these drugs.
Now, you also just described the fact that there are, there are now recognised to be a number of different uh, forms of the COX enzyme. What's the significance of that? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, there had been pharmacological evidence of um, uh, the fact that there could be different forms of COX for many, many years, actually dating right back to 1972. Um, when it was observed, for example, that paracetamol, which is an, an unusual uh, aspirin-like drug, if you want to call it that, in that it doesn't ha really have any anti-inflammatory properties, although it is a very good analgesic and antipyretic. And we made the observation in those days that um, paracetamol seemed to be more active on cyclooxygenase taken from the brain than it was on cyclooxygenase taken from peripheral tissues like the spleen or white cells, for example. And we formulated the idea that perhaps there were different isoforms of, of COX in the body and they responded differently to these drugs. Well, in those days uh, it was just pharmacological evidence and the, the idea sort of lingered on in the literature, but there wasn't really any concrete proof that this was the case until 1990, when um, two groups actually, were, who were looking for something else at the time, noticed that in cells that were subject to um, what you might call inflammatory activation, uh, began to synthesize uh, a suite of rapid response genes, amongst which was a gene which had a very high homology to the cyclooxygenase gene. And when this was expressed, it gave rise to a very similar product with a very similar catalytic activity. And this became known as COX-2, uh, cyclooxygenase 2. And the significance of this is that this enzyme, unlike the original cyclooxygenase seems to be inducible under inflammatory conditions. So generally speaking, and this is not an invariable rule, but generally speaking this enzyme is not present in very high concentrations in cells except when they are damaged or they undergo some sort of stress reaction. And then it suddenly appears and then it begins to synthesize prostaglandins um, in much larger amounts than so that sounds very attractive, a target which is only switched on in, in sites of Indeed. disease activity. Mm. But, but in, in fact there were a number of uh, problems with the initial COX inhibitors which were developed. That's right, well once the two forms of COX had been um, discovered there was a, a mad rush to test all the NSAIDs that we had to see which COXs they inhibited because it would have been very nice if they only inhibited COX-2 because that was the COX that seemed to be the one responsible for inflammatory prostaglandins. But actually it turned out that most of the ones that we had in our sort of armory at the time were pretty good inhibitors of both. And in fact it's likely that treatment of patients with virtually any NSAID that was on the market before let's say 2000 actually um, inhibited COX-1 and COX-2 to a certain extent but that the therapeutic activity probably correlated more with the COX-2 inhibition than the COX-1 inhibition. And, and the thought was that by inhibiting COX-1 they were producing their side effects, um, the damage to the gastric mucosa and, and uh, so on. And really it, it, it was a difficult situation because we suddenly realized we'd probably been treating patients with a drug that was only you know doing two things when all we wanted to do was to, to do one. So the, this whole idea that a selective COX-2 inhibitor would be a superior therapeutic um, gained a lot of traction and um, the pharmaceutical industry in a, um, really uh, pulled off I think a remarkable feat of drug discovery and synthesis and I, I think they, they came up with selective inhibitors very rapidly and they were on the market very very quickly as well and there were two market leaders in, in 2000 um, that was Merck, Merck's Viox, Rofecoxib and Searle's uh, Celecoxib, or Celebrex, as it's, as it's known. Um, and these were tested in models of, uh, in, in humans, obviously, and they showed less GI side effects, although there were GI side effects, uh, but they were, you know, to a, the, the incidence was much less than they were with conventional agents. So it seemed initially uh, that it was going to be a success story all the way, but something began to uh, uh, pop up in the studies and that was that alongside the uh, better GI tolerability was an increase in cardiovascular deaths and this was uh, this became a major issue uh, over the years and 
led to the withdrawal of Vioxx from the market after a series of uh, black box warnings and so on had been put on. And um, it's, I think it's fair to say we still don't really understand uh, why the uh, COX-2 inhibitors produce this effect. But what I would say is that it seems that this is an effect that's shared, not, uh, that's shared by all NSAIDs, actually. And I suppose the situation was that the other NSAIDs had been around so long, no one had ever really bothered to look at the cardiovascular uh, side effects of them, generally speaking. I mean, there are exceptions to that. But once the cardiovascular side effects of COX-2 inhibitors had been shown to uh, you know, be, in some cases, deleterious, people began to look at other NSAIDs, and they found that pretty much all of them have the same effect. They can all cause an increase in blood pressure, uh, and with its attendant risks of stroke and MI and, and other pathologies. But, but n nonetheless, what we have, I guess, is two push-pull factors. We've got the question of adverse effect profile, yes. but known benefits in, in, in long-term yes. risk, and therefore a great interest in looking at other potential opportunities to influence selectively yes, the system. Indeed. Would you comment on what, what might be the, the current or future opportunities to, yes. to look for new drugs in this area? Sure. I mean, the, once again, the industry has been very innovative, and one of the things that they've tried to do is to combine known NSAIDs, for example, naproxen, even aspirin itself, with an additional moiety that delivers a um, uh, something like nitric oxide, which has uh, very powerful gastroprotective actions, um, and uh, thereby removing a lot of the GI side effects associated with the drug whilst preserving its ability to reduce inflammation. And since NO is also has, is also vasoactive, it was hoped that the uh, cardiovascular side effects of this type of drug would be less. More recently than that, uh, the same idea has been tried using H2S delivering drugs, and um, I mean at the moment all these all these drugs look look very good, although none of them has actually reached the market yet. But it's certainly in animal studies, the data looks uh, looks really excellent. So that that's one possible way forward. The other uh, thing I think is worth flagging up is the issue of paracetamol has never really been. Uh, completely uh, solved and a few years ago it was suggested there might be other isoforms of COX cyclooxygenase including one called cyclooxygenase 3 uh, which was purported at the time to be more sensitive to paracetamol and uh, other uh, related antipyretic agents and this was uh, caused a big stir at the time although unfortunately it seems not to apply to humans although it's maybe uh, applicable to some other animals, so we still don't know, but I'd be very surprised personally if we don't find further isoforms of COX or COX-like enzymes which are important in NSAID action. That's my personal thought about it. And when when are you consider enzyme blockade? There's, there's always a risk there may be other substrates, unrecognized substrates, yes. which, which could be um, or recognised, which may, may be important in other ways. And there are various syndromes which can be exacerbated or, or, or initiated if, if aspirin and these other drugs block the enzyme. Yes, indeed, yes. Well, you're thinking, I suppose, of Ray's syndrome. Or well, Ray's syndrome, for example, but yeah. also late-onset asthma. Where, yes, where that's, that, that's true. I mean, there are aspirin-sensitive asthmatics. Again, I think the reason for that has never quite been uh, worked out. Um, it's... Uh, alleged anyway that the COX-2 inhibitors do not cause aspirin sensitive asthma whereas most of the other NSAIDs uh, have a similar profile to aspirin itself. Um, there are, there's a suggestion that perhaps it, this only occurs in people who have viral infections at the same time and this somehow alters the profile of lipid mediators in the lung such that it, aspirin may shunt the arachidonic acid substrate down another pathway and cause asthma I th you know, I think that's it's still a question that's being debated in the literature. And the other key therapeutic area we haven't touched on is this fascinating question of anti-cancer effects of, of the COX-2 inhibitors, but also um, aspirin. Yes, well, and this is very topical at the moment. And uh, actually, that the, the idea that um, NSAIDs might, be, might have anti-cancer properties has been around an awful long time. Um, and I think it first came about when people noticed that... Uh, rapidly reproducing cells produced huge amounts of prostaglandins and uh, people began to look at uh, biopsy samples of breast cancer and other types of cancer uh, 
demonstrating that they seem to have abnormal uh, prostaglandin generation. But now it's got much more sophisticated and I, I think um, there was a study that came out of the University of Oxford recently, about two weeks ago, suggesting that um, you know, uh, 75 milligram doses of aspirin taken over a period of some years led to a fairly dramatic reduction. I think as much as 20% uh, was mentioned uh, in the uh, incidence of a variety of cancers including bowel cancer and prostate cancer and, and, and so on. Again, I have to say the mechanism is not entirely clear, and there, there have been um, a lot of uh, reports that this doesn't necessarily depend on the COX inhibitory activity mm. of these drugs, uh, or it may depend on its, a its action on platelets, um, thereby preventing metastasis from occurring. So I think it's still a very interesting mechanistic question, but I'm sure that um, the idea that COX inhibitors can reduce at least bowel cancer is... Uh, is a very sound one, and I think that's certainly the case for some subtypes of bowel cancer. So, so I guess it needs to be a cautionary note in, in that we've discussed several potential serious adverse effects of the treatment, and, and it's always a question of making sure that, that the risk and benefit is taken into account in, in Absolutely. choosing treatment. Absolutely, of course, of course. Well, Professor Flower, thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you.